So last week we talked about some of the traditional strategies of organizing in terms of formal hierarchical arrangements uh, where people exist you know, in a structure, they work within that structure and hierarchy, and that's how they get things done. And many of us know that working in those kind of hierarchies um, full of maybe red tape or bureaucracy can sometimes be really frustrating. We also know that that's not exactly how work gets done. So this week, we're going to talk about relational strategies of organizing, network strategies of organizing, in ways that uh, help to um, enhance that traditional organizational structure that we looked at. Because we know that a good deal of the work that happens and the interaction that happens um, can't always be explained by hierarchy. We also know that hierarchy can be um, really slow in getting things done. Not everything can bubble up to a um, general manager, CEO for every decision, or connecting people, um, who, who connects people throughout multiple divisions or departments. Um, many times you need to talk to somebody in another division or department, or you need to collaborate or work with them. And so how does, uh, how, how does that traditional notion of organizing um, really, how can that be enhanced or explained by another perspective of these relational or network strategies of organizing. I found this uh, uh, org chart, a version of an org chart, back from 1943 in an employee handbook for Disney called The Ropes at Disney's. And in 1943, if you started at Disney, you would get this employee handbook that would have this interesting and unique org chart associated with it doesn't look anything like those org charts that we saw last week of the functional uh, organization or product organization. This one um, depicts the interactions between all the different departments. You see there's a kind of central group of the directors of you know, how, a, how a movie gets made, starting from at the top from Walt Disney himself, but there's also a set of directors right in the middle that, that showcase the interaction between the animation department, the people who used to do ink and paint and actually, you know, paint the cartoons, the cameras, the sound, the music, um, different production and management functions here. And you might not be able to see it, but at the very bottom it says this chart designates operations and not authorities. So it's not a hierarchical org chart, but in, in a sense, it's really a kind of process-driven organizational chart that shows who interacts with whom in a much more network and relationship-oriented way to showcase how these different interactions happen. So even back as far as 1943, certain people, you know, certain organizations were still thinking along these lines. And, and here's again these two versions of, um, you know, the, the theme that you've seen us carry through even from week one. We describe a lot of work in organizations in this kind of hierarchical perspective on the left, the traditional org chart way of doing things. But we know that how work actually happens isn't reflected in that org chart. People are interacting across those div div division or department boundaries. They're negotiating. They're uh, talking to somebody else in a different group. They're collaborating with people in different departments based upon different areas of expertise. A lot of work in an organization happens by a natural, fluid, organic network type perspective. So it's that network and relational perspective that we're going to talk about here. Relational strategies are all about linking. How do you connect those different departments that we looked at last week so that people can effectively get things done? Imagine a sales division that is organized in a geographic way with departments in North America, Europe, Latin America, and Asia, and that each one of those divisions has a contracts team, a training team, different sales compensation team that support the, the sales team members. Well, wouldn't it be the case that our contracts group, for example, we might want to have some consistency between those groups, or maybe there's a problem in one group and somebody else has actually solved it in another group. Have you ever been part of an organization where it seemed like uh, you were reinventing the wheel, or the left hand doesn't know what the right hand is doing because there's no coordination between different groups? Well, we want to see more of that coordination, not creating all of those barriers that we might have done in the traditional perspective, but we want to connect people. How do we foster those networks? How do we encourage people to develop relationships across those very traditional lines of organizing? 
moving to uh, a very collaborative way rather than a hierarchical way of getting things done. So what if we decided to establish a global sales contracts team formed of members of all of those different groups that could collaborate, share problems, solve problems, in working together? So these relational strategies that, that we'll talk about of, uh, of creating networks and teams are exactly the way that we can get that done. Networks are connections that occur, you know, as a as a as a web, as your group of contacts, colleagues that you have uh, outside of your own individual department, and that you can where you can meet people from around the company in different groups. You have your own professional network um, inside and outside your own company. Networks are great because they encourage communication that doesn't follow the formal path. Again, we're talking here about kind of maybe in networks and more informal, um, informal interactions. Networks are really beneficial to organizations because they tend to occur naturally. People can um, quickly know who to contact in another division. People are eager to form them. They're easy to foster. Um, and they don't really add any levels or meetings or formality. People can connect in different groups to get things done. But there are drawbacks of the network, a network perspective as well. If we wanted to uh, formalize it, networks tend to be more informal. They depend on spontaneous interactions. You run into somebody in the hallway that you haven't seen in a while. Uh, you meet somebody for lunch just to chat and catch up and share what's going on in your different groups. Those, those interactions support getting things done in the organization because you have a contact, or you know somebody in finance or marketing or whatever it is. Um, but if it's a critical process of the organization, if it's really important that the engineering group and the um, marketing group are meeting to negotiate and talk about new product direction and things like that, we probably don't want a network to do that. We may need more of an official team to be formed um, because that's a critical process that needs to be fostered. Networks don't have documented processes. There's no they're more informal, so it's difficult to capture learning across the organization, but networks are really a key way um, that you get things done. To foster and support networks, there's a couple of different ways that we can actually encourage people to broaden their networks. We can co-locate people. We can have people work on the uh, same floor of the same division, going back to our, you know, some of our, maybe the Sales comp example isn't a great one, but you know if you located everyone who does the same type of work on the in the same building on the same floor of the building, they're more likely to meet to contact each other. Something called a community of practice, where people meet on an informal basis, because they're like-minded people who do the same type of work. So maybe they have brown bag lunches to talk about observations they have about um, ongoing trends. Annual meetings, annual retreats. Uh, also foster networks, different groups that get together. Um, the uh, uh, DeVita, um, the kidney dialysis provider here in the Denver area, has an annual meeting where they invite all employees in to hear about uh, strategy and connect with colleagues. Training programs formed of um, members from different divisions or departments. Training programs are a great way for people to network. Rotational assignments where you move somebody temporarily uh, to a different group or somebody maybe attend somebody else's staff meeting, um, different ways of coordinating uh, are also informal ways of fostering network. Many organizations have uh, electronic coordination mechanisms, technology, online uh, discussion boards, online social networks where people can, can meet and informally contribute and discuss, uh, discuss things as well. Teams are a little bit more of a formal way of encouraging organizational networks and, we, and uh, encouraging relationships, and we read about this in the chapter as well. Um, teams bring together people from across different divisions, uh, particularly cross-functional teams do this, that um, allow people to both be part of the team, like sales compensation, but also um, formally report back to a different division. Teams can be permanent or ad hoc. Often teams are given the responsibility of solving a problem or some authority or empowered to make some decisions. Um, and the nice thing about teams is that, again, they cross different groups or divisions, so they speed up activity and communication from throughout the hierarchy, but they don't increase 
uh, headcount. They don't require any new resources typically because people spend time on the team that they uh, ordinarily would have spent in the, the rest of their job. Some of that can be a challenge though because there is time to build team skills and teams can waste a lot of time if there isn't a clear a clear charter. So teams can come into conflict and that can be more difficult uh, increasing the time required to solve to solve problems on a team if uh, the team isn't healthy and hasn't given, been given some, some resources. So here we just see some examples of these, uh, of encouraging networks, encouraging teams that build upon some of the formal organizational uh, arrangements like we talked about last time, uh, different kinds of formal hierarchies. Now we see ways of cutting across the hierarchy and teams and networks are two ways of, of doing that.